In this week's episode, I'm talking to Martin Freeman from Medallion, Australia, about how he got into sourcing, building a sourcing team in Expedia, and his first impressions about the state of sourcing in Australia. This is episode 15 of the Sourcing Challenge Show. I'm your host, Mark Longren. This week's show is brought to you by SourceCon Europe. With SourceCon only two weeks away, make sure you head over and secure yourself a ticket. Go to europe.sourcecon.com and put in the discount code SCSHOW to get 20% discount on your ticket price. Hope to see you all there. I kick off the interview by asking Martin how he got into sourcing. In 1997, actually, <laughs> is when I started off as a sourcer. So I, I've had kind of two career changes in my, well, two extra career changes in my time. So I, when I kind of left school, I actually wanted to be an architect. Mm -hmm. So um, I worked for civil engineers and my dream was to, design bridges and, and kind of buildings, etc. But mm -hmm. there was a big crash in the early 90s. I kind of left there and thought, I need to do something a bit more um, kind of stable. So I was like, right, I'm going to be an accountant because everyone needs an accountant. <laughs> so, um, so I was an accountant for six years. Oh, wow. um, and uh, eventually I was working for a telecoms company called um, Energis, which was bought by uh, Cable and Wireless. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and eventually I got introduced to a recruitment agency um, called uh, Glotel, which was formerly Coms and PC People. Yeah. Uh, and I got in a, a finance role uh, at that company and then I had uh, an internal headhunter there. Uh, and she was chasing up for a payment of her invoice and typically I wasn't ready to kind of pay it yet, but she said like, the way that I handled the call was you know, very professional and, you know, what did I feel about maybe getting into the, you know, recruitment position? Um, I really hadn't thought about it before, but I was seeing some of the, the commission. Um, <laughs> You're seeing what I mean. <laughs> so my, my eyes kind of lit up a little bit. Um, and I had a really cool director um, and, and CEO of the company he said, look, if you come across as a, as a recruiter, we know that you're not a natural salesperson. We know that you're not coming from a recruitment background come across um just embed yourself in the dba team you know learn your learn your kind of your your, your craft and we give it 12 months there'd be no targets attached to you you just kind of you know learn a job mirror people um and i was just kind of like chomping at a bit you know i just i couldn't sit there just i mean it was a very different world back then I, you know it's very paper-based there was tipex you're scanning CVs into the system. You're punching, you know, keywords into a VDU. Um, and I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. It was just like, I was just chomping a bit and I've got my first deal under the belt. It was a Cisco network engineer. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm hooked. Um, and I was, I was kind of saying to my mentor at the time, I was going to him, do you think the boss would mind if I kind of worked during my lunch hour? Cause I was like really naive. And, and he said, the more hours you put in, the bosses would be absolutely delighted. So I was just chomping at a bit. And yeah, I kind of moved in as a kind of a sourcer working towards BT account mm -hmm. um, back in 1997. And yeah, kind of, kind of took off on there really. Um, gone through the whole evolution of, well, several evolutions of sourcing in that time from, as I say, very paper-based and tipex through to the, job board era of like job site job serve that was uh, kind of in the, the late 90s and early 2000s and then you know monster etc come along and, and then um you know linkedin come along you know roughly 2005 2006 yeah um and we i've just kind of see it develop from there really so yeah a bit of a long-winded answer but um <laughs> yeah 20 years into two two minutes is yeah, it's funny, I mean, because like the, the team that I remember from Cisco, that would have been 2010, 9, 10, yeah. something like that. Very few of them are still in sourcing. So most of them are, you know, switched to the dark side or uh, yeah. so you're like, you're one, of the, you're one of the only ones that I know from kind of Europe that I remember from the early days of, of when I kind of knew what sourcing was that is still in sourcing yeah it's kind of I, I mean i still we we had a great team at cisco just before you you joined but like between 2006 and 2009 before the financial crash we, we had an amazing team so i mean when i joined cisco there was me petter andrew smith dan wazard that you, you probably yeah. remember 
Um, there's a few others and we grew the team quite a lot, but we literally were kind of like a band of brothers kind of thing. Um, we walked in there one day and uh, I kind of went through Hudson RPO and there was 120 open vacancies. I, and there was me and Petter sitting there was like, where do we start? And I think for six months, it was literally six months. So I kind of still clearly remember it. I didn't, I, I thought, I'm not going to really learn about the business. We just need to kind of focus and get through these requisitions as quickly as we possibly can and, and, and you know, get some level control. Yeah. Um, but yeah, over time, like Dan Wazek was in sourcing for a while, but he's kind of moved into kind of programmatic stuff and, yeah. and kind of wider, wider HR. Uh, Andrew Smith, um, he was a great sourcer, but he's moved into more the like the talent analytics side of things. Yeah. Um, the, the one other guy that worked in the team, and he come a bit later on, was a guy called Stan Lin, and he went back to China with, with Apple. Oh, cool. um, and we, we did something you know we didn't realize it was quite um you know groundbreaking at the time i, I you know that's kind of word off the top of my head but we we kind of built one of the first kind of talent communities before it was kind of known as talent community i, I think um you know it was roughly about 2007 2008 and that kind of social media era started to kind of kick in twitter just kind of launched and um and we just kind of, you know, I, I decided that I was going to kind of reinvent the job description and make it a bit more media savvy. So I was kind of embedding videos into job descriptions and PDF documents and um, Twitter kind of launched. So I was kind of driving some traffic to our, uh, well, within the talent acquisition team at the time, we actually created the Cisco's uh, Twitter recruitment page. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember, there was, uh, I don't think we had a LinkedIn page at that time, but I think there was kind of two social media channels. And then from there, um, Andy Smith developed like a very rough and ready database where we was collecting lots of kind of candidate information. I think he did it in like VB access kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and he was collecting lots of emails, information. And at the time you could even still scrape you know, LinkedIn was giving you lots of kind of email information at the time before they realized about the data privacy. So we was, we was putting lots of information there. And then um, Stan Lin did like the front end UI UX piece, uh, as we know it now. Um, and all of a sudden we kind of created this like weird community where we got lots of engineers chatting and then the hiring managers saw this and thought, oh, this is great. And they were chatting and we were just kind of leaving them to their own devices. <laughs> uh, and it was a bit of a shame because like at the end of, you know, the financial crisis kicked in and, um, and I had to take a bit of a sabbatical from Cisco, I kind of went away for, for 12 months, went back in the house and to the agency side of things. But yeah, after that, it kind of dissolved a little bit. But um, yeah, I think within about two or three months, we had something like, 20 to 30,000 people kind of not not kind of giving like real time messaging but they was kind of like posting messages mm -hmm. on there and then someone from the business would see it and respond accordingly um yeah but unfortunately it just kind of evaporated yeah. in 2009 but yeah it, that was that, that was a good time um and then i kind of i, I went back for, for kind of 12 months you know I, once um cisco's headcount had been released i kind of went back but then i was offered a, a permanent position with blackberry um yeah and that was a good position um it was just a shame that google and, and apple came along and and kind of destroyed that really because I, I i just got offered a kind of leadership position <laughs> um to to become a sourcing manager managing a small team of you know two to three people and then you know google android kicked in and, and apple and kind of literally stuck the knife in the back of, of Blackberry and, and uh, yeah, that was that. So that was probably the, the, the shortest leadership role I've taken in this <laughs> role. Um, time is everything. Yeah. Um, but then I kind of joined Betfair and, uh, and that was a good gig. Um, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, the, the Expedia one was a, a completely step up. Um, because how, long, how long were you at Expedia at the end? So I was there for about four and a half years, there oh, thereabouts. Wow. Yeah. Um, 
it wasn't supposed to be like that. So the plan was I, was, I was supposed to be there for six months. And basically I worked with a guy at Blackberry uh, and there's another leader that I, I work with now at Medallia, uh, Stacy. Um, and I would, so the, the guy in question is a guy called Tito Magamo. He's a, like a senior product director at LinkedIn now. Uh, and he was kind of ex Google, ex Linda, Gates Foundation or whatever the company's called. And I used to be his kind of go-to sourcer in a mirror. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, look, um, sorry, I'll take one step back. So I was actually offered an extension with Betfair. Um, and I was also offered a sourcing position with uh, Shell. Mm -hmm. um, but I really wanted to work with Tito again because he was like one of the early um, speakers at SourceCom. Mm -hmm. Um, he'd been at Google. He worked very closely with, you know, with, with Shelley and all that kind of gang. And I thought, I'm going to learn a lot from this guy. Um, and he said, look, come on at Expedia. Um, you know, six months gig, what we want you to do is just show the value of sourcing to the organization. Um, so it was really coming in there from nothing. We didn't have a, you know, CRM, uh, completely bare bones. And, um, he said, come in there, show the value of sourcing. And the aim is that, you know, once we start getting some wins under the belt, we'll start investing in the team. You'll be there on the ground and, you know, there'll be kind of opportunities for yourself as, as the company progresses uh, or as the function progresses. So um, it was, yeah, it was interesting because they just gave me like the 10 hardest jobs <laughs> within Expedia. It was just... You know, it's like, it's like, like what you would give an agency that you don't really want to work with. It's like, yeah, do these ones. Yeah, do these ones. And so, and I, I, this was, this is God's on trip, like day four. Uh, so I was still kind of onboarding, you know, Expedia at that time had about 10 or 12 brands. I'm still learning about each of these brands. And they said, go and meet the CFO of hotels.com. I was like, okay. So, and this guy, you know, I, I'm going to keep the expletives off, <laughs> off the table. Uh, yeah, you can understand why I'm probably Campbell. So, yeah, he was like an old boy soldier, you know, ex-military type guy. And he went, you know, I've got this finance manager's position. It's the best job in the world. I don't really understand why, you know, nobody would want to work here. Um, you know, what are you bringing to the table? You know, we need to go to agencies. And, and at this time, I was like, wow like this is the first job i've been handed i've been you know given the biggest so-and-so in the world and i thought this is going to be a tough gig i like it. yeah thanks thanks very much so but i kind of took it as a bit of an opportunity to, to prove this guy wrong so i kind of had to on that spot kind of give him the whole value proposition of sourcing he wouldn't kind of doesn't matter what i said he weren't going to take it and um, I kind of said, look, I'm going to, you know, aggressively go out to the market and, you know, try and find some profiles and give me two weeks. It's not an overnight thing, but give me two weeks. I'll give you a report and uh, we go from there. Um, and I had a couple of, you know, mishaps at first because I wasn't quite used to the profile they're looking at. But literally I went back about three or four weeks later and I went back with this I, I developed this really great report in, in Excel with a help of a guy from Bet, Bet, Betfair. I'm not going to take the whole claim for it, but we, <laughs> we kind of, um, we developed this spreadsheet where it had kind of embedded pie charts in there. And we was literally able to scrape all the names from databases. Uh, and we were able to kind of really filter through in terms of what the response rate rates were, why people were rejecting, was it compensation, was it contract, mm -hmm. was it location, was it just the wrong role? Uh, and I went back to him with two fantastic candidates. Um, and this, like this report, and it was literally a case of like, you know, put that up your jumper in, in kind of harsher language. And, and he, he couldn't believe it. And, um, it's quite weird, really. He, even at that point, even though he looked at the profile and said, went, yeah, you've, you've got it kind of thing. Um, he said, I still want agencies on it. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to win this battle. Right. So yeah. you pick and choose your battles. And I was like, All right, that's, that's me off. I'm going to, I'm going to go on to something else. In the meantime, like the manager, you know, met these two people and she went, 
yeah, like I want that person now. Uh, and they hired my silver medalist a year later. We had a lot of, you know, quick wins. Um, and we were able to kind of ramp up the sourcing function pretty quickly. I mean, I was, I was getting some real heavy hitting kind of placements that they, you know, the business was just struggling to find. Um, and then they kind of saw the value of, of, of kind of sourcing. Yeah. Um, so we kind of ramped up the team pretty quickly, but the problem is with success is just that people want more and more as you, you've probably gone through this as well, but unless you're going to really kind of fund it properly, it's just difficult to sustain long term. So, I mean, to be fair with Expedia, they, they did, you know, pay decently and I was able to kind of bring some good, good folk, but it was just like, you know, you've got 800 requisitions. They all stem from customer services up to, you know, VP level positions five sourcing consultants globally based are not going to be able to you know we we're only going to be able to chip in with a handful yeah. and um unless you give me the funds to you know really kind of bring in a, a big team then we're going to kind of say you know we're going to kind of set a you know mark in the sand and say look we're going to focus on these roles we train your you know your frontline recruiters in terms of how to do some sourcing on here yeah. um obviously you can still use agencies on some of those low value positions where you know that's just you know the one-off low intelligence yeah, exactly there's no point of building up any kind of pipeline because we're not going to have this role again for two years. no uh, but um i mean we yeah we did some really cool stuff there but it, it just become you know what else can we ask the sourcing function to do and it was just it was just unsustainable i mean it got to a point where we were doing lots well you know i i i think at one stage i was covering about three positions uh, and that's no word or lie i think i was doing a lots of market intelligence because i was i was working in management position at that time so i was getting lots of business requests in terms of you know, we had a sales function and they wanted to open up a new entity in Myanmar. And then they would ask me to go and, you know, what's the talent availability for hospitality folk in Myanmar? Well, they just opened up the borders. It was very, very limited. But they would ask me to go out there and do that. So I was doing that sort of things. And then I had to try and support as many of the brands in London in terms of just day-to-day -day recruitment activities. Then I had to kind of train, you know, recruiters how to source. Um, and then I kind of get involved in the analytics side of things because we kind of developed a playbook and, you know, how do we best align sourcing to, you know, business priorities. So I, I was actually covering about three or four positions. Um, I couldn't really hire anyone in Australia. It was, it was just constant juggling. And then to, mm. you know, to add to more stress, I just had my first child. So it's just, <laughs> I remember, yeah. it's just like, you know, how much stress do you want to kind of <laughs> leverage on? How did you manage your team? Because they, like they were distributed all over the world then. Like you literally had people everywhere. So uh, my, I had someone in Singapore. Um, I had Krishma in India. Um, I had a couple of folk in, in, in London, like Josh Dodds, I think you know. Mm, yeah. And um, he was a good guy. Uh, I had another source and then I had about three or four people in Seattle and Detroit, etc. So I, I literally was on line. So I used to leave work in the morning, like half five, I used to get to work for about seven o'clock and then I used to go home like nine o'clock plus in, in the evening. So that's the best for family yeah, life for sure. Yeah. No, and <laughs> you know, it, it, it got to a point where, you know, let's, let's be truthful about it. My wife was like, yeah, we need to have a bit of a conversation about your yeah. working hours. This is not going to, work out too much longer otherwise so um and she used to be a consultant so you know for a consultant to say that to to a yeah. hr person is, is saying something so yeah it was um yeah i i think the good thing is that i had a lot of trust in the sources i did kind of empower them to have a bit of a voice you know and if they felt that something wasn't quite right they could bring me in but at the same time you know that you know for their own development they should try and push through some of those challenges and try and figure it out because you know they're intelligent folk and you know we're dealing with other human beings but try and get to the heart of the problem but but you know recognize that you're not a you're not a servant to the recruitment function you're there as partners and that's kind of where you are yeah um and you know don't be afraid to 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 have a voice at that conversation yeah. and you know that you know sometimes that does bring in a bit of animosity but 
sometimes that's a good thing, um, you know, if, if done in a constructive way, not in a, in an aggressive, yeah. um, you know, uh, in an aggressive way where you're just arguing and the, the relationship just kind of breaks down. But if it's in a constructive way, then yeah, you know, there, there's always going to be that kind of bit of friction. Then again, yeah. how did you select those people? I mean, you know, building up a sourcing organization, especially in a company like Expedia, like what, what did you look for? Yeah, I, I suppose there's, I, I suppose that like with all sources that I kind of hire for, I've hired in the past, there's probably like four or five different traits that I kind of look for. So one is around curiosity. Um, you've got to have that kind of curiosity for technology, mm -hmm. um, not only just to identify and engage with talent, but you know, how do we streamline our processes and make them more efficient? Um, because there's always these kind of time pressures on us. And, you know, if we can use, you know, some tools out there to, to help us, then you've got to be able to go out there and, and kind of find those and, and kind of bring them to the table. I think another one is around being data driven. So if you struggle to, you know, tell stories with data, um, you know, you, 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 you might struggle in some of the environments I've worked in the past. You know, mm. we, 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 we kept and told that, you know, you're going into meetings with very intelligent people. All they understand is data. Um, and, you know, you've got to be able to go out there, you know, bring it in, but also present it in a way that can be consumed by business leaders. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, you, you're not there to necessarily give them the answer they're there to make you know to, to make the final decision but you're there to give them all the information that they need to make those kind of final decisions so yeah certainly the data piece um has become certainly up there in terms of you know what you need to be as a as, yeah. a, as a consultant i think the other one is around growth mindset um and you know some people what the hell's going on about here so I don't mind if people fail on occasions, like try something, fail, but as long as you learn from it, yeah. um, if you keep on failing and you don't learn from it, then there's another conversation to be had. But yeah, if you, if you try something, it could be messaging to candidates. If you're doing some like, you know, AB testing, where it may be, or if it's the way that you're presenting data to individuals, try it. If it doesn't work, fine, we tick it off, we move on, we try something else. But yeah, learn from that. So that's kind of what I mean by growth mindset. And that's actually my <coughs> daily opinion as well. I think having that deep passion for sourcing. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've spoken to a few 360 recruiters and they say, yeah, yeah, I source and okay. I, no, okay. So tell me about your sourcing. And they go, yeah, I do bits on LinkedIn. and <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah and i'm like well what, what do you do if you take linkedin away and you know that conversation starts going a bit cold and um and then i kind of probe a little bit further and i'm like well you know who are you following on you know do you follow any communities or are there any individuals that you're following you know and you can quickly peel back whether you know you're you're talking to a like a snake oil seller kind of thing <laughs> or if they do genuinely have that kind of passion for sourcing so um i typically don't hire people that kind of um are recruiters that have kind of touched sourcing i, I i'd rather hold out and find someone who really has that deep passion for sourcing yeah. and i think at the end of the day and this sometimes is a bit controversial but I, I still think you've got to be able to deliver i think two years ago i started off a conversation pretty innocent um, in the SourceCom Facebook group, <laughs> I kind of put it out there and I said, well, you know, how many hires do you, you know, what do you think a, a reasonable measure is for hires that sources should make in a calendar month? And I, I kind of put it out there, two to three. And it just started off this mad conversation and everyone was getting involved in like, why do you measure your sources and hires? And I'm like, well, I'm not actually measuring them in hires, I'm measuring them in offers because we can't control the last 5%. But you know, I, I, I personally believe that we are there to put bums on seats at the end of the day. And if we don't, there's going to be some bright spark within the organization somewhere down the line that's going to say, well, what value you bring to the table? And yeah, there are some people out there that are kind of saying, well, you know, shouldn't it be by leads and how many people you're kind of bringing into the organization in terms of just having that wider conversation on that? 
I, I kind of get it that you know, some of these relationships take a long time to mature, but I think ultimately, you know, I, we've, we've had some people, they do a lot of stuff in the community, but they've come and worked, you know, one or two companies and they've just not delivered. Uh, and I personally believe at the end of the day, you've got to be able to deliver. Um, and yeah, so those are kind of like the five areas I, I was kind of focus on. Uh, I'm not a futurist, for instance, but <laughs> you can see our role's probably going to change and yeah. develop. You know, I, I think if you kind of look back, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you know, when sourcing was in its infancy, it was all about paper base and you've got requisitions, you farmed them off to clients and you've got some hires. Great. Um, now, if you kind of look at the role, we, you know, we get involved with market intelligence, we do training, we do systems analysis. Uh, but I think if we kind of take it further, I mean, you know, we're going to be become, we are going to become that kind of total talent advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see clear signals where you kind of had that traditional recruiter model where they were the, you know, the talent advisor to mm -hmm. business. And I, I, I'm certainly seeing it in a couple of organizations where the sourcer is taking up the advisory piece um, because they're the ones who's pulling all that information and they can, you know, present it in a consumable way to the business. Uh, and recruiters are starting to be a bit more on the process piece in terms of you know, setting up the requisitions, making sure that they're posted and pushing people through the process. De dealing with inbound and yeah. Yeah, maybe all that kind of stuff and referrals, but in terms of like the general market analysis, um, you know, four or five years ago, that was very, you know, that was seen very much as the recruiter's role. Um, now it's certainly, I'm, I'm certainly seeing some shifts yeah. in that direction that's coming into our space. You know, if you kind of think of all the skills that you need around that, around, you know, sources historically have been a bit more introvert, but you, you definitely need to start developing those, being able to produce a voice and having a voice at the table. And it's not an easy skill to pick up overnight, present data and, uh, and, and feel comfortable in front of the business and not dissolving on the spot if you're kind of pushed a, you know, a little bit tougher than you normally are. Because I, I think you just got to keep on, making yourself relevant to the situation at a time and you kind of look at technology you know it's growing at such a rapid pace we're definitely on a, some sort of cusp of you know that 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 next generation of what the you know what the the, the sourcing or the tools out there will, will look like and if you're not kind of finding roles to supplement your traditional job then you know you can find yourself being very obsolete and out the door of an organization very rapidly get involved in branding initiatives and all that kind of stuff. And that's, you know, stuff that wasn't on the table on the sources desk, you know, ten, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, but now that's very commonplace that we're, we're involved in all those aspects of the position now. So, you know, will we be called source consultants? I, I really, I, I really don't know. I mean, that's going to be part of our role, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly a lot more that's going to be added to our plate. And I think just the expectations of what, a source, uh, tr let's say a traditional sourcer can do these days. It's just, you know, gone through the roof. And so, yeah, our, our, you know, if you kind of fast forward, you know, the calendar, you know, three or five years, our roles will change again. Um, but I think we're certainly in a, a good position that we certainly pick up, you know, the pulse of those changes very rapidly. And, um, and yeah, and, and hopefully we can, you know, benefit from that um, you know, moving forward. But yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be interesting times ahead. But at the same time, I don't want to kind of lose those old skills as well. So <laughs> like, you kind of, you've got all these tools that you know, build your Boolean strings, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, when I've done those training and presentations, um, you know, I always start off with you know, showing them how to build the strings first of all. But then at the end of it, I always kind of say, well, there are these tools here that can help you. And they're like, well, why did you show me that in the first place? But I think unless you if understand. If you don't know how to do it yourself, you're not going to understand what the tool does. And it's like, if you exactly. don't, if a tool controls you, then you don't have control. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it, it is interesting, but yeah, as I say, it's, um, 
you know, interesting times ahead. Um, I'm still not quite sold on this AI piece shit that you kind of keep on hearing about and blockchain this and that. And I'm just like, and when you kind of see some of those tool demonstrations and you kind of see the results, you kind of think, well, yeah, you're not really got it down yet because I've done some really you know, straightforward searches like React developers in Washington and how's that compared with LinkedIn? And like, well, I thought you was pulling information from LinkedIn and why did the results differ from here to there? So you can kind of pull them apart pretty quickly. And, and then the, 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 I had a funniest demonstration once and I, I won't name the company and, and their title was something AI. And, um, and me and my boss, we just like, where's the AI piece? Because the guy, the guy said, Oh, well come down, uh, come on site, meet some of the managers, do some video recordings. We'd go out there and, blast the market, you know, with an email campaign. I was like, where's the actual AI piece? I, I, I was expecting a product demo and there wasn't one piece of product. It on, was a on service. Show. It was just a you know, backdoor agency service. <laughs> so I'm always a bit, after that, I'm always a bit skeptical when I, you know, when I see people kind of band AI and blockchain around, I kind yeah. of, I'm sure that will come down the line, but yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I haven't seen a product that there that's kind of blown me away yet. So. And you made the big move. Oh, how long you been out in Australia? Oh no, it's uh, literally two months. Yes, yeah, it's, it's all going well so far. Um, yeah, the, the weather's great. Um, <laughs> that's a good thing I would say. Um, market conditions for what we do is is a little bit. You know, we have to wait and see. Um, again, I was, you know, before joining the Dali on a permanent basis, I was, I was freelancing for them before, but um, before joining them, I was, you know, I was quite open with my bosses and saying that I'm having conversations with a couple of tech companies. And uh, yeah, they, they kind of saw the value in terms of what I would bring to the tech, but they just couldn't get their head around that to hire me would probably cost them about three or four times what they would have to pay someone in in in, in asia yeah. and it was kind of a hard justification so to me it wasn't a hard justification because i could say well you know this is you know this i'm, I'm happy to demo what i can do and if yeah. you you know want to you know take that away and have it on it then you know please feel free and then you we, get what you pay um, for so yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think there's, you know, there's a few, you know, source of consultants, yeah. you know, on the periphery out here. And I think, um, you know, we need to kind of bang our heads together a little bit and figure out, you know, there's, there's definitely an opportunity. I just haven't really figured out mm -hmm. you know, what that looks like yet. Um, there, there's still, as I say, the traditional agency route and the, the RPO route, and there doesn't seem to be too much in between mm. uh, for, for highly skilled, you know, sourcing talent like ourselves. Um, so yeah, ask me again in six months time, I may be in the same <laughs> position or, um, I might be on a, on a plane back to the UK, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, overall, um, yeah, it's good, good move so far. I mean, you, you don't come to Australia unless, um, yeah, unless you're, first of all, you're very rich cause it's quite an expensive city. <laughs> city. Um, market sure. price, this is just, um, astronomical. You just can't believe it. It makes you eyes water when you, you see the uh you know the, the the house prices here but um yeah you know um we, we've got a couple of kids now my wife's from australia yeah. and we just kind of felt that the time was right to, to it's the lifestyle as well it's the you know the, like you look at okay you, you can work like work is work no matter where you are pretty much but it's like what do you do in your weekends and it's like yeah i would i would rather be close to bondi beach than Brighton so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty good and I, I must admit the, the one thing different between London is that actually people here will have a conversation with you and not think that you're weird <laughs> so you know, I've gone to a couple of parks and I think the first park I went to was Bright Sun's Day and there was a couple of you know there's a guy and a lady who just relocated here and they started conversating with each other and then they just asked me oh you know what's your thoughts and and I thought do I do I join in here or um, are they going to think I'm weird? You know, so, um, yeah, I think people are here a bit more um, open to yeah. having a conversation. I think it's just that their kind of nature of their character. Um, yeah, some people can be quite blunt, but then again, that's just another Aussie trait. But, um, yeah, I, I think uh, overall it's, it's a good move and, uh, yeah, not entirely too sure if uh, I'll be back permanently in the UK, but uh, I'll certainly be back for 
for the occasional travel. Yeah, exactly. um, there's some things you, you do miss there, uh, but it's hard to kind of list them off the top of my head, I must admit. I, every time I try to think of one, I kind of think, well, this is what I kind of get here. So you've always been one of the ones that, like once every year or something like that, you'll post something in some group about what tools you're using. And it's always like, ah, <laughs> oh, interesting. What's your process for really kind of selecting tools that you're working with? Because it's always, it's a mix of tools we all used five years ago that you somehow still make it work. And then it's just tools that nobody heard of. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think one of them is around uh, cost. So um, I always try to get as much as I can on, for, my, for my buck or if I can get the free options, I, I will. I, I suppose I have, um, just in terms of my makeup, I, I do have some knacks of understanding how Know, 15 tools can work together pretty quickly and easily and when you kind of start navigating those things um, and you show people they kind of get it but then I, I, do, I do realize that there's probably some other tools that that, that I need to kind of supplement what I, I, I've got in my armory so I think in my whole of my um, bookmarklets and bookmarks etc I probably have about four or five hundred tools that mm -hmm. I probably got at my disposal probably use about 50 or 60 mm -hmm. you know, throughout the week um but I, I try to introduce them in in small doses um you know to individuals um, in my team and, yeah. and further field but i still quite like some of the, the the original ones like i mean i still use you know shane mccluskers tools yeah. quite frequently um you know pulling email addresses from you know domains etc and I know that's kind of been done with other tools, but you know, I, I still like that tool very much, uh, a, a lot, actually. There's always a host of email lookup tools, and I, I get through those credits pretty quickly. So I always have to have about four or five in, in the background there. Um, I'm always kind of on the Chrome store. If I can't find anything, I'm on Google and I find other tools. I, I quite like looking for the, like, the market intelligence tools like the, the Owlers, the Edgars, etc., because... I think some of those are kind of good when you're presenting information to, to kind of business leaders, et cetera, and you're, you're pulling in, you know, really kind of valid information and it has that kind of immediate credibility. I don't necessarily kind of look at all the tools ongoing, but I kind of make sure that I have them in the toolkit. And I think it's just understanding that I will have some of those tools. And if I can go back to them at some point, I know where they are. Uh, if I need them, um, but yeah, I still use lots of you know CSCs, etc. Done some of my own. I've, I've grabbed some of Irena's. Um, I still use lots of those, certainly in intake discussions and for hiring manager and, and, and doing front of them. Um, the email lookup tool is good. Still use some of the the like the uh, the Source Hub, etc. And, and similar tools like that. Just you know, if I'm a bit time pressured. Um, but yeah, I, I think overall, it's um, it's just really kind of understanding what tools you've got and when to use them at the right time, etc. And I, I think I have a pretty decent grasp of what's going out there. But I think at the end of the day, I'm a decent tools expert. There are other well-known sources out there that are good on that side of things as well. Uh, but I think I have a kind of blended skill set around, um, you know, uh, you know, a very good understanding of tools. Um, but also having that kind of business acumen, et cetera, um, and also that delivery skills as well. And I think having that kind of combination is, is kind of what you need. If, you, if you're just a tools expert, but just can't deliver, then... You know. So I think it's just having that... I think I have a decent balance across the board. What's something exciting that you're working on now or something you're working on now that you're excited about? I think the challenge with Madonna is so we've gone through lots of high growth uh, at this moment in time. Yeah. Um, heading towards you know the public listing but it's a kind of new challenge for me because I haven't really worked in that kind of startup environment before mm -hmm. so kind of getting the brand recognition out there is is it's been a challenge because we, we speak to really high caliber profiles and then you kind of say yeah we I work for Medallia and they go who's Medallia so <laughs> that education piece so doing lots of kind of branded initiatives for our internal teams quite interesting 12 months ago we were still working off Google Sheets yeah now we've kind of implemented a you know lever CRM ATS mm -hmm. and now we're trying to take it to the next stage forward so I think a lot of it will be you know, how do we take a lot of our time away from the search and so we can kind of get on the phone you know, more to candidates because that's where our time is more 
valuable than mm-hmm. just doing those repeat low value tasks. Um, and we haven't really kind of found a tool out there that can really help us do that part good. I think um, there's been a few tools out there, like Hire and Solved and Hire Tool, etc., that can do it on parts. But mm-hmm. in terms of the scale that we need to do it, there's not really something out there that can that I've seen that can that can do it. And so I'm doing lots of investigation work there. I think the one thing I, I, I really enjoyed doing at Expedia, and I'd love to do it here at Medallia, I did a big project there where I took all our contact information from our CRM, from our career site. And it, I think it, I, I, opened, I, I opened up this spreadsheet once and there was 365,000 lines of data. <laughs> um, and it contained contact numbers and email addresses and company information, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And as soon as I opened up, I thought, I'm going to get sacked in five minutes flat. This is <laughs> such a big breach of data privacy. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, the, the challenge that we had at Expedia is that we had a really rubbish ATS and people were just using LinkedIn, but then LinkedIn didn't have the contact information. Mm-hmm. So I was able to really kind of build up this kind of hybrid CRM platform where it was very tagged, um, and I had all the contact information from our ATS, our landing pages on our website. Um, I was pulling lots of information from places like GitHub and Stack, etc., and all these other different communities. Uh, and I managed to do something like build a, a, a pipeline of 80,000 Java developers in our three main mm-hmm. tech hubs, India, London, and, and Seattle. Um, and I'd like to do something similar to like that here. Yeah. It was... Um, massive it was like a day and night project for <laughs> it was literally about four months yeah. literally looking at um you know all these lines of code cleaning it up uploading it back into linkedin yeah, and tagging. yeah. Uh, it was yeah I, I, I what prompted it was just that they was going to shut down our existing ats and i thought mm. all that data is going to go what are we doing this is just ludicrous and i uh, I just, it, I remember it well, I, I woke up like three o'clock in the morning. I was like, it was like the light bulb went on and I couldn't sleep and I had to go to work early the next day. And I was like, set myself up on this task of coming up with something. And it just kind of evolved from there. I mean, it started off as just pulling all this information, but then I was kind of pulling everyone's uh, first degree connections from, you know, from the business into the system. And I, I, I don't know how much, it, I mean, when I left Expedia, that, as I mentioned, there was, a, there was over... 1 million points of contact information yeah. in LinkedIn, all tagged. Um, so literally the recruiters, all they needed to do, I kind of created these pipeline requisitions. So all they needed to do is literally press a button and filter by location. And it would bring them up a, a list of live profiles that engage with Expedia with the contact information at their fingertips, you know, go away and, you know, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and contact people. And I'd love to do something like that here at Dahlia because yeah. we, we've got a kind of good opportunity to do that. I, I must admit, like, we've got, we've got some super smart individuals. I mean, what they're doing around customer experience and, and tracking the candidate experience, I, I, I haven't come across before. <laughs> um, like, literally, you know, we're using, like, in, you know, NPS scores to you know, track month after month in terms of how the candidate experience. And I don't know... You know, people kind of send out surveys and they kind of get the, the mail back and it's like, yeah, great. But we're, we're right, literally, yeah. we're literally, you know, what's your experience when you walk through the door? Did you get your, you know, did you get your lunches ordered? Did you meet the people on time? Did they introduce themselves properly? And we're, we're collecting that, all that kind of mm. feedback data. Um, so it's really quite powerful because we, we just generally have to be that way because because we don't have that immediate brand recognition yeah. what we've got to do is focus on the parts that we actually do very well uh, and that candidate experience piece and customer experience is, is something that we do exceptionally well uh, and we've got to kind of play that as our kind of ace trump card really so that's kind of what we're we're, we're aiming towards at this moment in time martin if people want to keep in touch with you and see where your australian adventure takes you further um how do they best do that yeah obviously linkedin get a hold of me there um i'm also on twitter uh talent source au i've changed it recently from uk <laughs> to au um my email address is mfreeman at medallia.com um happy to help i mean i, I posted out that tools list if anyone has any questions around it just 
drop me a message happy to help um i know i've been kind of quiet like i've, I've done lots of present I've, I've done presentations to american express and bbc mm. etc just in terms of getting their capability up and I, I i don't ask for a dime in return or anything in return i just really want to kind of get the awareness out there like what you guys are doing with SourceCon in the uk etc and i kind of feel and i think yeah. the australian market are right for it as well like I'm, there's a few there's some, like rpos have been doing some and then but i think like similar to what the uk was like three four or five years ago people want to learn more they maybe just don't know where to start you know I, i'm happy to do it and I, I never go in there like most sources we never kind of go in there and have this kind of snobby attitude it's there that we want to kind of help and, and make sure you know someone is getting the best advice we can yeah. possibly give and um yeah i think if anyone wants to tap me up for anything um even if they just want to kind of make that connection i'm i'm happy to do that and, and feel free to get in contact and i will respond because i'm generally online <laughs> 20 hours a day really so yeah feel free to get in contact. thank you all for watching i'll be back next week with a new sourcing conversation if you want to be one of the first ones to hear about new episodes make sure you subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications